Hey, everybody, it's the Drive to School podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, and my friend David Zills is back. Uh, we are talking about miracles and uh, how to, to sort of sort through all of the claims out there with, with a, a right amount of skepticism. Uh, David, my friend, how are you? I'm doing well. I got my caramel mocha coffee. Always got to advertise for my favorite coffee. Um, I'm so much more basic than you. This is just black. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> mm. All right, so we opened up a can of worms last time, and we, we recognize, so we, we kind of need to, to address it. Other religions claim miracles too. So, so yeah, this is, we... this is a big topic. And so what we spent the last several episodes doing is making a case that miracle claims can be genuine, um, kind of the positive case. But then there's this other side, which is if they're genuine, how do we make sense of all the claims out there, you know, kind of at a philosophical or theological level? And there's this argument, which I think is a very sloppy argument, but it gets at some intuition that I think is getting at something real. And the argument is, if there are miracles and religions that claim opposite things, then they cancel each other out which what does that mean? They cancel each other out. Does it mean they never happened or does that mean they're not valuable as evidence? You know, I, I don't know what that means. Uh, it probably depends on the person making the argument, but there is kind of this intuition of if you're going to use miracles to support a religion, then what happens when contradictory religions have miracles? And that that's a big one. Right. And, and so, I mean, there's, there's lots of ways that this is where it's sort of been tackled throughout um, story and, and media and, and, you know, movies um, where we, we sort of have warring gods who are all sort of in competition for our faith. And, and you know, the, the more faith you have uh, or, or the, the society would have, the, the stronger dominance that that particular deity would have. Uh, but everything is sort of existing out there. And so the, it's, it's a nice way of sort of saying all roads lead to, to heaven, which again, as, as Christians, we, we, our scriptures speak against the other sort of saying look if there there really are sort of all of these things out there maybe more importantly uh, at least for a society like today's we don't have to follow your god's rules because other gods are doing miracles too and so it's it's sort of worth addressing um not because we want to sort of just make a case for a christian morality but because we recognize that that if everybody out there is claiming a miracle what does that say to a jesus who says i am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes from the father except through me yeah, so I think uh, I think this is a big objection, and one way one way I think to frame the argument to like make it kind of very bullet point logical is you the argument tends to start with this implicit assumption, which is if Christianity is true, then there should only be Christian miracles. Like that's the implicit assumption behind all these arguments. And so then when people observe miracles in non-Christian circles, they're reasonable based on their assumption to say, well, Christianity is not true. But we have to look at that assumption and say, is it true that if Christianity is true, then only miracles would happen in Christianity? And when you look at the Bible's witness to what the Bible says about miracles, this is actually not something even the Bible claims. The Bible is very honest about the fact that there are other miracles in other religious contexts, and it offers explanations for why this is the case, even if Christianity is true. So I think we need to look at those explanations. Right. This is actually an important thing to recognize, especially throughout the Old Testament. There are dark, false gods who apparently have enough power to do dark false things. There are demon possessions where um, even just sort of recognizing uh, the, the, the demon legion that, that gives the man strength that, that men shouldn't have. Um, there, there are other dark forces out there. Uh, Milton, I think, sort of has my favorite explanation in this in Paradise Lost, that, that he sort of says, you know, all of the demons dress themselves up as false gods. And so all of the Egyptian gods are, are demons in disguise, because after all, the, the, the goal of the devil and all of his horde is, is to make you believe in something that is not Jesus. So other religions, just fine. Whether or not they know the names of, of Satan and all of his horde, they don't care. They just don't want you to confess the name that Jesus is Lord. Yeah, so that is the first explanation there. I think there are two that we could go with, and some make sense in some contexts, um, some in others. Um, but the first one is that there are not just spirits with supernatural ability on the side of the true God, but there are enemy spirits. And, and the you know, the Bible is very transparent about this, you know, all the way from the beginning with Moses, 
um, you know, Moses and the 10 plagues, those were kind of the equivalent of Jesus' resurrection in term, terms of the veracity uh, of the Testament. Yeah, it was saying, I am God, trust in me, you're going to always look back to this as a grounding for your faith. And, um, but at first, the Egyptian magicians who are working based on, in their mind, the Egyptian gods are able to counterfeit these miracles. Um, but like one of my apologetics teachers said, nobody counterfeits a $3 bill. You know, so if if you're counterfeiting something that shows that it's valuable and it's real, um, you know, their miracles, if they're real and if they're valuable for getting people to, to believe things, it makes sense that if there are malicious spirits, they would want to counterfeit them. Um, and like you said, in the New Testament, you've got, um, you know, demon possession and Craig Keener has a whole appendix in his big two volume work on cases of, of power encounters, as he calls it, between God and evil spirits. And some of them, let me just say, don't read that appendix at, at night in a dark house by yourself. Um, right before you go to bed. But um, so, yeah, this, this is one possible explanation at the end of the Bible in revelation, you know, we talk so much about the resurrection of Jesus being a huge miracle validating his claims about who he is. Um, there's a, there's a account of prophecy and revelation about at the end of time, some man opposing God and recovering from a fatal head wound and everybody runs after him because of this. So, I mean, the Bible is not at all, you know, living in this world where there's only one supernatural agent who does things that are interesting and surprising. Right. No, that's a good way of putting it interesting and surprising. Yeah. So, so there's got to, like I said, we, we have to do reasoning outside of the miracles. We can't just say something surprising happened. There's power here. Let's follow it because you can't, you know, you don't just want to follow someone who's powerful. You know, Hitler was powerful. That doesn't mean you want to sign up for, you know, the Hitler youth. Um, you I need like to look that. at what, what is their character too. And that's where probing the character of the spirit. And that's where you know, obviously Jesus is love and goodness and truth all personified. And so that's where probing the character of the spirit is important. And ultimately, you know, the test for that is, you know, Jesus. Right. And that's, that's ultimately what it's going to come to is, is that there is a, a Jesus who wants to speak and he speaks about his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins that, that all who believe w would be saved. Yeah. Yeah. So then the, the second um, explanation that sometimes could work is that maybe in other religious contexts, it's not evil spirits working, but it's God and he's doing it out of benevolence, not to not in a way that would deceive people, but in a way that would bless people. Um, you know, so there are cases where God works outside of his people to bring people into his kingdom in the Bible as well. Um, you know, you have the star of Bethlehem that brought the Magi to Jesus. These were people who were interpreting the stars, not something that God, you know, really condoned, but God used it to bring them to, to find, you know, their savior. So, um, lots of examples of this kind of thing too. And one example today is, um, and this maybe isn't uh, an example of a miracle in another religion that would seem to go against Christianity. It's one that actually seems to support it, but there's this phenomenon through throughout a lot of the Muslim world today where Muslims are having dreams and visions about Jesus talking to them. And then he says, go talk to so-and-so who's some Christian in their town. He has a message for you. Um, and so this was, Lee Strobel had another interview in his book, The Case for Miracles, with a missionary who was overseas and has interacted with people, you know, who have had these kinds of experiences. And and he said, yeah, this, at first, when someone, when the first person told me they had experienced this, I thought maybe they were nuts. But then I started hearing cases of it, like Iraq, Syria, all over the place. And the Christians started putting ads in newspapers saying, have you seen the man in a white robe? We have a message from him for you because huh. they started realizing God is doing something. We don't know why, yeah. but he's doing something and it's an opportunity for us. And so um, I have some notes here just from, from that um, book, the case for miracles, just to kind of illustrate what these things can look like. 
Um, so there, there was a case where Kamal um, is, a, is a man, I think he's in Egypt, and um, he was busy with his day, but he felt God was leading him to go to a market in Cairo, Egypt, and a Muslim woman named Noor um, spotted him from a distance and started yelling, you're the one, you're the one. Um, and it turns out Noor had had a vision of Jesus walking beside a lake with her. Um, and she said she had never felt such love and peace as she did in his presence. Um, she didn't want him to leave. And she said, why are you visiting? She said to Jesus, why are you visiting me, a poor Muslim mother with eight children? And all he said was, I love you, Noor. I have given everything for you. I died for you. She said that as Jesus turned to leave, he told her, ask my friend tomorrow about me. He will tell you all you need to know and understand in order to understand why I visited you. And so it, it, she sees somebody behind him, behind her and Jesus, and she sees someone wearing the exact same clothes. I think the same glasses, the same smile, and this is Kamal. And they end up having this huge discussion about the gospel that, you know, over a, a period of time. And so it's interesting because Jesus, it's kind of, it reminds me a bit of in Acts when God goes to Cornelius and says, talk to my friend, Peter, he's got a message for you. And then he goes to Peter and has the whole vision about, you know, don't call unclean what I've called clean. Um, and then Peter goes and brings the gospel. And, and so this, the, this person who's interviewed makes the point, I believe it's this person, that, that these miracles don't circumvent scripture, but they point people to scripture. Um, so he's not circumventing the means of grace, but he's also being very creative in pursuing people um, to, to, to get them to be open to the gospel. Right. This is actually a really, really interesting sort of test case to me um, in that it, it confesses something that that goes against what you would normally hear. So the, the Islam faith recognizes Jesus as a person and a prophet, but they they rec they they believe that he did not die. Um, the, the, the common confession is that um, he, he was not the one who was crucified, but it was actually Judas who was dressed up like Jesus and, and uh, crucified in his place that, that um, Jesus in this vision says, I died for you. It, it points to something that, that sort of helps us sort of navigate these waters. First, we say that, uh, again, it's not that these things always happen, but it's also not that these things cannot happen. So when we, we come across these things, we test them. What does scripture say? Does the, the, the vision, does the, the experience, does it point away from scripture or does it testify alongside and point you towards scripture? And here we, we have something that points towards the truth of the scriptures. God be praised for it. Yeah. And I want to, I want to push back on what you said, not because I disagree with it, but because I think some people in our audience might react to it um, mm -hmm. a certain way. And so I want to bring clarity. Um why do you pick the scriptures as the test? Why not the Quran? You know, so that's where you have to first say, you know, maybe there's something supernatural going on, but we have to examine the worldviews and say, which one do we think is true? And John talks about the apostle John in the New Testament about test the spirits. And one of the tests is what does the spirit say about who Jesus is? Um, and I think that's significant because, and this is where we're going to have to go, um, I think maybe one more episode on miracles, and this is where we're going to have to go, which I think is the crux of all of historical apologetics, all of Christian case making, sh showing evidence for Jesus, it all hinges on the one question, who is Jesus? Because if Jesus is just a prophet in the Muslim tradition, or if he's just a moral teacher like the Buddha, um, that's one thing, but if he is who the New Testament claims he is, the son of God and the only one in history who's risen permanently from the dead, there's something unique about him that then he sets a standard that other people aren't able to fulfill. And so that's why we have evidence supporting an identity of Jesus that's above the identity of other teachers. And then that becomes our standard for testing the spirit. So, you know, I think, you know, Yes, we want to test things with scripture, but the, where we have to go first, we have to say, why do we believe the scripture? And I think that's where it all hinges on the identity of Jesus, both in terms of testing miracles and testing religions to see what, what religion do we think is true. Right. And the resurrection stands apart. 
um, even from the, the supposed miracles of, of uh, Muhammad. Um, so it's, it's one thing to die and then three days later rise again and be witnessed by 500 some odd people. Um, it's another to say that hypothetically, uh, you pulled the moon from the sky, put it between your legs and put it back in the sky so fast that nobody saw it. Um, one stands a little bit more credible to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think that the two things for me that where I focus the question, who is Jesus, is who did he think he was? Did he claim to be a teacher? Did he claim to be more than just a man? Who did he claim he was? And then um, how do we make sense of that? And then the second thing is, did he rise from the dead? And so Jesus' identity and his resurrection, I think those are the places that we have to focus on to wrap up our discussion of apologetics. Absolutely. Uh, and so we'll, we'll pick up there next time. Uh, David, thanks so much. All right. Sounds good. Have a great day. You too. Bye.